pistol formation. Madsen in front of Genty. He's going to give it to Genty. Over right tackle to the 50, to the 40. Gets to the sideline, to the 30, to the 20, to the 10, to the 5. Touchdown, Ashton Genty. Shager in this game now. 9 of 13 for 146. Closing in on 8,000 for a career. Shager in the pocket. Shager is going to go down. A sack back around the four-yard line. Virgin Morgan is there again. Back from a bye once again, the second of the year. Welcome into Jay Sports Bar. I'm Jay Tust. A big show coming up because it is game week for Boise State and UNLV. Many are calling this the Group of Five game of the year. And when you look at their resumes, man, does that description fit this game? Boise State enters this one 17th in the country in the AP Top 25. They're 5 and 1 overall. Everybody's talking about them and their Heisman training. Trophy candidate running back Ashton Genty. On the flip side of this thing, though, UNLV off to a 6-1 and one start. They just won in Corvallis, coming back to beat Oregon State 33-25. The Rebels are bowl eligible for a second consecutive year for the first time in program history. So much to get to. We're going to talk about the three things you needed to know about this matchup between Boise State and UNLV. Also, a special guest on J Sports bar this week. Former Seattle Seahawk and Utah State star Robert Turbin is going to join me. He is actually going to be on the call on Friday's game, so we'll get a little perspective from the broadcast booth. We begin, though, with what everybody's talking about. Ashton Genty. Last week, we spent a ton of time kind of recapping all the buzz around him and his growing Heisman Trophy campaign. Following last week, and again, Ashton was on a bye, he still remains one of the odds-on favorites to win the 2024 Heisman Trophy. He's joined by Miami quarterback Cam Ward, and then right behind them is Oregon quarterback Dylan Gabriel. Both Ward and Genty are plus 225, so slightly uh, above 2-1 to one odds. Dylan Gabriel is at 4-1 to one odds. Then there's kind of a drop-off. This thing is really turning into a three-horse race, if you will, because Clemson's quarterback checks in at 20-1 to one odds, and then Colorado two-way superstar Travis Hunter checks in at 25 to 1 in terms of his Heisman odds. We're going to get to him in just a moment. But Ashen's coming off a of bye week, and boy, did he kind of need it. You go all the way back to two weekends ago, Ashen had a career high tying 31 carries for 217 yards and two total touchdowns in a road win at Hawaii. Now, some of the storylines around Ashton this year have been around him sitting in second halves and blowout wins against Portland State as well as Utah State. Number two didn't even touch the field in the second half, and some people believed that hurt his Heisman odds. My answer to them is he's still the favorite despite sitting those second halves. At Hawaii, though, a very different story. Played all the way to the end of the game. Had 34 touches and, as I just mentioned, a career high tying 31 carries. So if you go all the way back to the beginning of the season, one of the things Spencer Danielson wanted to identify within each of his players was their breaking point. How far can not only he push them, but really them, they push themselves. And this week I asked Spencer Danielson about Ashton Genty's breaking point. I haven't found it yet, Jay, I'll be honest with you. I mean, that's a young man that he practices like it. He practices to play that way. Every day, you know, everything's tracked with GPSs. And uh, every day, Coach Hilgar comes to me in the middle of practice. Ash is high today. Ash is getting up. I'm like, that's Ash. And it's not just him. There's multiple other players on our team. that are like, that's our team. We don't, we don't deal with, and this, that's Boise State football, the blue collar, the chip on their shoulder. It's not, all right, guys, it's practice. We got we to gotta do it now. No, no, that's player led. With Ash, I mean, he is ready to give everything for this team. Not because people can continue to talk about him, which they will, and he's deserved that, so he can help the team. Whatever that looks like, from special teams to offense to catch the ball in the backfield, getting the ball handed off to him, whatever it takes. Whatever it takes to win the game. Yet another phenomenal performance for Ashton Genty. He has now had 200 or more yards in most of his games this year. He's had at least 100 yards after contact in four of six games this year. He has 1,248 yards rushing. That leads the FBS by 213 yards. And I remind you, Ashton, 
didn't even play last week. Iowa's running back, who is currently in second place on that list, has 1,035 rushing yards. He's played in seven games. Ashton has only played in six games. And one more fun fact for you. Ashton was the first player in the FBS to go over 1,000 yards rushing this season. He did so at halftime on a game that was played on October 5th. The second guy to do it, again, Iowa's running back, it took him until October 19th to do it, and we are still rating, waiting on the third running back in the, at the FBS level, level to hit 1,000 yards on the season. So not only are we talking about Ashton Genty, but the country is talking about Ashton Genty. For me, one opinion in particular stood out. Dallas Cowboys All-Pro linebacker Micah Parsons last week said that he has never seen a player like Ashton. We talked about that and heard from Micah Parsons on last week's Sports Bar. This week, San Francisco 49ers standouts George Kittle and Debo Samuel both elaborated on the situation regarding Ashton on Debo's podcast. What you think about this 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 kid, man, Ashton Genty? Right. Boise State? Man, oh. nuts. <laughs> no. Like, it's, un, it's unreal. The like, best thing I've seen is his stance. He is just straight. Like, like standing, standing straight up. <laughs> like, there's no bend in his knees, nothing. Like he And someone said he looked like uh, Jason, uh, like the horror. The horror uh, man a dog. Oh, yeah. like, like, he just stands there. And like I'm gonna destroy you guys. It is hilarious. And like growing up, like Reggie he's playing Pee Wee football right Reggie now. Reggie Bush was my favorite, like my idol growing up because I like played running back. And like this kid, like he's that man, that man just he wilding out right now. So that is all the good, but there is a reason this is kind of a hot topic discussion. And Colorado two-way superstar Travis Hunter kind of turned it into one last week. Now. Travis Hunter's unbelievable. I mean, what he's doing on both sides of the ball, the amount of snaps he's playing in a game is absolutely ridiculous. And you can absolutely not knock what he is accomplishing on a football field this year. Now, for him to speak highly of himself, I would have no doubt about it. Like, he deserves to do that. But he did have an interesting take on Ashton Genty. Again, we played this for you last week, but it's worth revisiting this week. Here is Travis Hunter on Robert Griffin III's podcast. And I want you to know that I don't want y'all to shy away from, from, from speaking that stuff into existence. Mm -hmm. I don't think that you can win it. I, 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 mean, I definitely think you can win it. <laughs> I know I can win it, but Robert I don't know. Robert couldn't win it either. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know who's there. I mean, y'all see Ashton Genty, and, but it's not like we haven't seen a running back that's good. Right. We haven't seen a player that plays both ways, and I'm gonna keep saying that. It's like he have 90, what I think 95 carries. Yeah. For a, a thousand, thousand yards. yards. Yeah. If I had 95 catches, how much yards you think I have? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. That's a good so point. That's a good so point. I'm trying to tell him like, if I had 95 targets on defense, what you think I'll have? Right. Uh -huh. If I had 95 catches on offense, what you think I'll have? So I try to take like I have. He got double the touches I got on the offensive side of the ball, and I still have defensive stats that's still crazy, and we only in. The week six. Sometimes it might feel like we're making a little too much out of this, but hey, it was Travis Hunter's opinion, and, and he almost kind of tried to dismiss Ashton Genty's accomplishments, saying that he is quote unquote a good running back. Well, yeah, we have seen lots of good running backs, but we have not seen somebody like Ashton Genty in almost four decades. At this point in time, with 1,248 rushing yards on the season, and he's only halfway through the season. His 13-game projected total is 2,704 yards. That would be the NCAA all-time record, passing Barry Sanders' record of 2,628 yards that he set in 1988. So what we are seeing Ashton do, again, is truly something we haven't seen in almost four decades. This week, for the first time, Ashton had a bit of a rebuttal to Travis Hunter's comments and his response is exactly what we all thought it would be. You're in a heated competition right now. Travis Hunter, the best two-way player on the planet. Ashton Genty, the best running back in the world. I seen Travis make a couple comments online. I don't know if you've seen it, it was recent. He's like, man, listen, he got 95 carries right now. He got that much. If I had 95 catches, I mean, how many yards would I have? I mean, and kudos to Travis. Like, yeah. he balling for real. Like, he doing some stuff we ain't never seen nobody yeah. do. Personally, I don't take no offense to it. Like, he just speaking his opinion. You know, everybody got an opinion. For me, is what I've been 
doing has been done in 36, 37 years. Long time. So that's something special. If I keep that up and you know break a record that's been around for 36 years, then I feel like you can't really compete with that. You know what I'm saying? Like, if the Heisman Trophy was to be awarded today, who you think winning it? You or Travis Hunter? Me for sure. You know I gotta say me. Travis balling, bro. He is, he is balling, but I just feel like what I'm doing is it's just too special. You know? I watch Travis. I watch his games like incredible player. Like I've never seen people yeah. really do. But I know myself. I know my talent. I feel like I'm yeah. the best player in college football. Ashton Genty, he is as humble as he is talented. And while I always thought he would say he believes he's one of the best football players, if not, well, the best football player in college football, I had a feeling he wouldn't do anything to knock Travis Hunter's game, and that's exactly the case. But a couple more stats to show you how truly phenomenal Ashton Genty's season and how, how it's currently going. So Ashton, as of last week, had seven rushing attempts of 60 or more yards. That's impressive, but the perspective you need, at that point in time, Texas, Oregon, Penn State, Ohio State, Georgia, Miami, Alabama, LSU, Ohio, or Iowa State, and Clemson were all in the top 10 of the AP Top 25. Those top 10 teams combined had seven rushes of 60 or more yards. So Ashton, as many runs of 60 or more yards as the top 10 combined. I mean, I, I don't know how much more perspective you need, but here's another one for you. Yards after contact, he is a unique human being. If you look at the most rushing yards after contact, this season for any running back in the country against FBS opponents, Ashton Genty has four of the top 10 single game totals. And not only four of the top 10, the top four. He had 233 yards after contact against Washington State, 168 yards after contact against Utah State, 163 yards after contact against Georgia Southern, and 159 yards after contact against Hawaii. Those are the top four rushing performances after contact that we've seen against an FBS opponent this season. Other good running backs fill out the top 10, but Ashton Genty has cemented himself alone in each of those top four spots. A lot of season left. Colorado's having a good year, and I do think that's important for Travis Hunter's uh, candidacy as a Heisman Trophy winner, but we're just going to have to wait and see how it all plays out. I have a lot of confidence in Ashton Genty, number two. This week won't be easy for him, though. He is facing UNLV in a top 20 rush defense in America. The Rebels only allowing slightly over 100 yards per game on the ground, and Ashton Genty is averaging 208 yards rushing alone. So something has to give in this matchup. I mentioned earlier, this feels like kind of the group of five game of the year, Boise State versus UNLV. If you look at ESPN's football power index, they weigh out a number of different metrics. One of the odds they give you, though, is a percentage on which they think each team will be involved in the first ever 12-team college football playoff. As it stands right now, UNLV's chances of making it there are about 17%. But it, it, it kind of feels like they don't necessarily uh, control their destiny in the sense that they have to beat Boise State in order to get back in the driver's seat right now. I mentioned UNLV, about 17%. The Broncos, by far, the highest-rated group of five team at 46.2%. So almost a coin flip on whether or not Boise State is going to make the college football playoff as it expands for the first time ever. Earlier this week at his press conference, we talked to head coach Spencer Danielson about this game. They're obviously trying to block out as much noise as they can. But Spencer is acknowledging the importance of this matchup and the challenge ahead. I'm shocked they're not ranked in the top 25. I mean, they, they, they deserve that for sure. And they play hard. I mean, once again, all three phases, I mean, they blocked multiple punts for touchdowns. Their best players play on special teams. Ricky White, one of the best receivers in the country, is playing on special teams. Number 21, one of their best receivers, one of the top returners in the country, right? Like, that's a mentality of a team. Like, they're a close-knit crew. And they are gritty and play tough. I mean, they, they've been down in games. They fight their way back to go dominate and win. I mean, I, I got a ton of respect for how he runs that program and, and, those, and, those, and their entire team in all three phases. Like, that's what I see is this is going to be an absolute heavyweight fight. Um, and I know they'll be absolute ready. And we got to work our tails off too. But this is a really good football team. I mean, Barry Odom, his coaches, his players, they bought in. They are on a mission. They know everything's in front of them. Um, and this is a big time game. It's, it's the biggest one for all of us because it's the next one. 
but obviously going down to their stadium to play them, it's it's um, some we're really excited for. But I got so much respect for for him and how he trains his team, and I know they will absolutely be ready Friday night. There are three things that I'm going to be looking at when it comes to this Boise State UNLV game. Number one for me is special teams play, and the reason why that's number one is because Boise State's lone loss of the season was because of their inability to cover on both kickoff and punt return against the Oregon Ducks. If they make one tackle, Boise State is in a much different spot right now. Oregon is undefeated and the number one ranked team in the country, and it took a last second field goal as time expired for the Ducks to knock off the Broncos. But if Boise State makes one tackle in either of those scenarios on special teams, they're, they might be top five in the country right now with one of the best wins in the country having knocked off an Oregon squad, right? UNLV comes to play on special teams. They've blocked a number of kicks. Uh, they have one of the more dynamic, underrated players, I believe, in the Mountain West Conference in returner and wide receiver Jacob DeJesus might be the most underrated player in the league. Way back at Mountain West Media Days, I asked Barry Odom about this. Ricky White had almost 1,500 yards receiving a year ago, right? Jackson Woodard, their star linebacker that was the preseason player of the year in the Mountain West. They play on a number of special teams units. And UNLV's head coach, Barry Odom, loves to create a competitive advantage, and he's willing to use whoever he needs to on special teams in order to create it. In special teams is where offense and defensive players come together, right? So I think so much of the mentality of your team you can see through special teams. And once again, it's not just one or two guys. I mean, Ricky White's on, on kickoff return, one of the front line guys. Like, I mean, they, they put their best players in situations to compete and help the team. And that's a testament to how hard they work, how hard they train. And you can see that with how they've played this season. I mean, they're getting better week in and week out. We've seen us grow in our coverage units too. And that's what I told our team. It is all about us learning and growing. And we're going to continue to work it this week. Today's a Tuesday practice. We worked on our coverage units, making sure our lane, our lane integrity, everybody doing their job, not trying to do somebody else's. We got to do a great job covering it down. Our kickers got to do a great job with where we're kicking the ball to. And we got to do a great job in our coverage units. I mean, it's especially with explosive returners like we've seen. And I think Jesus is one of the best in the country. Um, we got to do a great job playing together. It's not going to be one guy that tackles him. It's not. He's too, he's too explosive. That's okay. We need multiple hats there with the right leverage so we can keep him hemmed in. But we're, we're, we got to keep working on it. I mean, it's something that we've, sh we've, we've shown to not do it well at points, and we've shown that we, we, we can do it well. So now we got to be consistent. The second thing I'm really looking at in this matchup is red zone scoring efficiency against turnover margin. This is strength on strength. Boise State has been one of the more efficient red zone scoring teams in the entire country, raking in the top 15 in red zone touchdown percentage. UNLV near the bottom of the conference in red zone touchdown percentage. How do they make up for it? In turnover margin. The Rebels are plus 12 on the year. The second best turnover margin in all of college football. Boise State, on the other hand, only plus one in turnover margin. So something has to give, and the Boise State coaching staff knows it. They're leading the nation in takeaways and turnover margins, so that's a team stat too. Not only do they take the ball away on defense, lead the nation in picks, they also don't turn it over on offense. And then, you know, they're one of the top rushing offense, one of the most explosive offense in the country. They're one of the top, you know, stop rush defense in our entire conference and the country too. So there's a lot of compliments that when you look at a team, it's not one stat or one thing, like you look at all three phases. I mean, they are they are a team that has talent across the board. They've done a great job in recruiting. And, um, you know, they play extremely hard. They're physical, they're gritty. You get something on them, they're gonna stay in the fight. And I, I respect that a lot. Finally, number three for me is dealing with UNLV linebacker, Jackson Woodard. The guys on offense are gonna get a ton of attention, but in my opinion, Jackson Woodard does not get enough respect on the national level. He has 63 tackles on the season, third most in the Mountain West. Four interceptions on the season, tied for second most in the FBS. Eight and a half tackles for loss, third most in the FBS. He does everything well, and personally for me, he kind of reminds me of former Boise State linebacker Leighton Vanderish due to his production, his length, and his athleticism. Spencer Danielson, offensive coordinator Dirk Cutter, and junior tight end Matt Lauder all shared their thoughts on maybe the best linebacker in the Mountain West Conference. I think the world of of Jackson Woodard. I mean, I really do. Watching this film, me and, me and Coach Cutter talked about him. You know, even just, uh, they were able to play on some on some days that either we were off or I was in the hotel before our game watching him. 
I mean, number seven makes so many plays. I mean, how he's trained, how he plays. I know he transferred in with Odom from Arkansas. I mean, I, I think the world of him. I promise you, after the game, I'm going to go find him and say, I do. I'm going to tell him that personally because I just love how he plays the game. I mean, he's he finds a way to make physical tackles, sideline to sideline. He's, I think, first or second in the country in interceptions as a linebacker. I love how Woodard plays the game. Like, as a linebacker's coach, like, I love how he plays the game. Uh, I think he played his best game in the Oregon State game. Uh, his, his length, uh, his speed off the edge. They move him around. He's versatile. They use him in different ways. He's more like a, like an NFL outside linebacker. He's a dropper. He's a rusher. Um, they yeah. They move. They move him around. I think he's just a ball player, and um, obviously, you know, it shows. He's got I think it's four interceptions, three sacks. So he's been doing you know a good job this year. He's not the linebacker that's you know slow. He's 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 a linebacker you know that's quick, but he's also a little bit lengthy. So. You know, he's an NFL type, you know, SEC linebacker. So, you know, he's able to make plays, um, you know, going against different teams. As I promised earlier, Robert Turbin joins the show. And uh, Robert, former Seattle Seahawk, Utah State star, and now getting in the broadcast booth. How, how is your, your latest professional endeavor going? You know what? It's really a lot of fun. One of the one of the biggest challenges when you transition out of football is really just trying to find two things. Number one, a space where you can still be in an area where you have so much camaraderie like you do in a locker room, that brotherhood, and be a part of a team in that way. And then secondly, something that gets you fired up, uh, like you're getting ready to, you know, kick off the football. Uh, and playing a football game and and broad and there's nothing like that. I mean, but broadcasting definitely brings a similar vibe because you know you're getting ready for the game. The game is hyped. This game this week is going to be huge. But every game is huge for me when I'm in the broadcast booth and I still get those same butterflies <laughs> like I did as a player. And then when it comes to like the production team and everybody who's a part of the game that week and everybody who's a part of really uh, the station overall you'd start to develop those relationships and that camaraderie similarly to like being in a locker room. So I love what I'm doing right now. I'm, 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 I'm extremely blessed. I think you're off to an awesome start. Real quick, I, I, I kind of want to go back to the past though because um, I remember in 2011, my first year here at KTVB, a team from Utah State rolled into Boise to play in a bowl game with a whole lot of spirit. The Aggies had been down for a while but you and some guy named Bobby Wagner came up to the blue and gave, gave Ohio just about all they could handle. What do you remember about that game in 2011 and how much fun that team was? And I mean, I even remember Coach Anderson, he wouldn't show us, but he told us because Utah State got to a bowl game, he was going to get a tattoo. Yeah, he did get a tattoo. It was pretty funny. But, you know, it'd be hard to talk about that game without talking about the season. And, you know, it was obviously my last season, Bobby Wagner's last season, and some other key players that were a part of that that special group. And, you know, I remember opening day, or opening week, I should say, we're at Alabama. They just won the national title with Cam Newton the year before. And all we had to do was recover an onside kick. And, you know, we would have upset those guys in Alabama. And, you know, we were in a lot of close games that year. Colorado State at home, you know, we lose by one point. Uh, right there on the goal line. But there were all so many lessons within those, you know, those early losses that sort of propelled us to be able to get to our first bowl game in 30 years at that time. We were at Hawaii. I believe it was week six. We're down 24-7 at halftime. We find a way to come back and win that game. Uh, and then we don't lose for the rest of the season, essentially, until uh, that bowl game. And so uh, it was a wonderful experience. It was our first bowl game. And so, you know, all the things that went into it, it, it reminded me of when I went to the Super Bowl as a Seahawk. And you just get gift bags, and you're getting this, and you're getting that, and interviews left and right, and you're doing team events and things of that nature. Top golf wasn't around at that time, but going bowling and stuff like that being a part of the community and doing some community events. Uh, you know, all those were exciting moments for us. Just wish we could have got the win, man. That's the only, that's the only uh, sour, the only sour taste in my mouth that I had from that day. It was it, it, a heck of a game, like I said. One of my favorite potato bowls since I've been here. And by the way, Robert, we got a Top Golf now in Boise. So ne next time you come back and cover a game here, 
We'll go hit up Top Golf because Bo Boise's grown a little bit since 2011. Yeah. A another thing I remember about you, uh, Robert, your, your NFL Combine photo, where you had massive arms, right? Like, uh, so I'm going to ask you: bigger arms, bigger guns, right now? You or the current Boise State running back Ashton Genty? I'm going to go ahead and give it to Genty, man. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I'll give it to Genty, man. Genty's one of a kind, man. He's one heck of a player and person. Uh, and it's pretty cool to see the success that he's having this season and really over the course of his career. What is it about him this year, though, Robert? And, you know, it's funny because I feel like national people, they'll talk about him, and almost everybody's complimentary of it, right? But when he gets compared to guys in Power Five conferences, when it comes to the Heisman, they're all quick to point out maybe strength of schedule or things like that. My argument would be is there are only two games in the Mountain West Conference play, meaning they've beaten a Washington State squad that's 6-1 and one out of conference play. Then uh, They came really close against Oregon, who's undefeated on the season. So – when it comes to the quality of the opponent, it's actually pretty good and even better technically than what Colorado's played if you go off ESPN's football power index. But for, but for him to break tackles and kind of do what he does, you got to watch him live in Hawaii. What's that experience live, watching him live do what he does? It was great, man. I think he's the, clearly the best running back, you know, in, in college football. And I don't pay attention to the strength of schedule and, and conferences. My thing is this. If you're playing against Division One football talent, then you're playing against Division One football talent. If it's University of Miami, or if it's University of Oregon, or if it's Oregon State, whatever it is, if it's not D1, then don't name it D1. Name it something else. But the fact of the matter is, Ashton Gentry's having success against Division One schools, and he's been consistent as can be. He's been the most consistent player in all of college football at any position. All right, mm -hmm. you can argue, you can you can argue that as well. Uh, and so I don't really pay attention to strength of schedule and all that kind of stuff. The fact of the matter is the kid's having an extraordinary year and he deserves everything that, that's, uh, that's coming to him. I did get to see him in Hawaii for the first time. Um, you know, I was amazed. I, I, I really just love the, the, the contact balance. And, you know, you're, you're, you're taught very young as a running back. Don't stop your feet on contact. And he's taken that from the time he was eight years old. <laughs> up until now because that's exactly how he runs we are lucky enough to get a chat with dirt cutter every week he obviously has seen just about anything there has been to seen in, in in football pro college whatever in the last 40 some odd years dirk loves to compare ash and Genty's game to maurice jones drew uh for me personally at one point in time I, w I was lucky enough the, you know, later in my college days to watch Reggie Bush. I think Reggie and Ashton are, are different players, but in terms of excitement level, they always put you on the edge of your seat because the next play might be a house call regardless of where you're at on the field. So for you, who is somebody that you might see as a comparison to Ashton Genty? Yeah, I, I, I always really take my time with this mm -hmm. because I've been playing running back since I was 10 years old. And I played it all the way through college, eight years in the NFL. I've been lucky enough and blessed enough to witness and be teammates with some of the greatest running backs of all time, Frank Gore, Marshawn Lynch, and others. Um, and so when it comes to the comparison thing, I, I, I really try to dissect it to a T. And, and maybe that's not the best way to, to, uh, to explain it, but... I don't just say, oh, you know, Ashton Gentry's good, so who's another good running right. back that I can compare him to? It doesn't you. always have to be, you know, some Hall of Fame running back to compare him to. Some people say Marshall Falk because of his ability to get in and out. Okay, I can see that. But in reality, and maybe Boise State fans may not like this, but this is just, you know, this is me and my evaluation. His running style is like Kareem Hunt. That's who he runs like, in my opinion. The contact balance, the keeping the feet moving, the ability to get out of tackles, like when there's three or four defenders around him and all of a sudden he just springs out of it for an extra five or six yards. That's Kareem Hunt, especially the first time he was with the Chiefs before going to the Browns. And even during the time with the Browns, he had a very similar impact as far as running the football. But low center of gravity. Now, Ashton Genty has much more big playability, uh, much more breakaway speed uh, than Kareem Hunt. But when it comes to patience behind a line of scrimmage, reading the creases, 
sinking the hips, getting in and out of cuts. Watch Kareem Hunt tape the first time around with the Chiefs, and I bet you'll see a closer comparison to anybody else that anybody has said about Ashton Genty. You know, at the very least, Robert, what I like about that is I've, I've, you're right. A lot of times the comparison is, hey, who else is good? This guy is good. I haven't heard anybody yet compare Ashton Genty to Kareem Hunt. And you're right. If you probably go back and you look at Kareem Hunt's early years with the Kansas City Chiefs, the way they run, similar. Another thing I like about that comparison, we haven't seen Ashton a ton in the passing game this year. He was heavily involved in the screen game uh, a year ago, but that's also an area where Kareem Hunt thrived, uh, you know, with, with the Chiefs initially. So mm -hmm. if you look, you know, past this year, I mean, Ashton right now is, he is the talk of college football. At, at some point in time, now we shift towards the NFL draft. How do you think what Ashton does you know, we'll, we'll transition into the NFL. And it, it seems like the value of a running back is slowly starting to come back in, in the uh, NFL. There was, there was a, uh, a period there where there wasn't true value being placed on that position. So yeah. how, how do you think that plays out? And, and Ashton Jetty being a part of that. Isn't that funny, huh? You know, there was, a, there was a running back that came out in the draft this past year at the University of Kentucky, Ray Davis. And I said, you know, watch out for this kid. And he's gotten his opportunity a little bit with the Buffalo Bills. Yep. That's where he was drafted. James Cook had an injury. Ray Davis has come in, and he's done really well. Why? Because it was the style of offense that University of Kentucky ran while he was there. Outside zone, under center. You got to get the ball. You got to read it. You got to hit it. You got to get downhill right now. You got to cut back. That's the style and offense that Dirk Cutter has brought to the Boise State Broncos which is why it enhances the success level Ashton Genty is going to be able to have in the NFL. He's running offenses that he's already going to be able to identify and be used to once he turns pro. It was very similar for me uh, when I was at Utah State. We ran a very balanced offense, a lot of pro-style stuff from under center, play action. We used to do uh, pass protection. It was 62-63. Well, guess what? In the NFL... It was the exact same thing in Seattle, but it was two jet and three jet. That was the only thing that was different. It was just called something different. But I had Mike to the strong backer, to the safeties in the backside corner. It's the same thing. And so being able to run that pro style offense in college enabled me to be able to, you know, get things faster once I got to the NFL. We ran power out of the eye, power O, outside zone out of the eye formation or single back. These are all things Ashton Gentry is doing right now. So his transition is going to be seamless after he gets drafted. So let me ask you this, Robert. Ashton Gentry is averaging 208 yards per game on the ground. UNLV, as we get into this matchup a little bit, barely averaging over 100 yard, yards per game allowed on the ground, 20th in college football. What gives in this matchup? And how excited are you to watch Two for Boise State, go after number seven, Jackson Woodard, for uh, UNLV, or vice versa for that matter. No, I'm, I'm, this is what football is all about, man. You know, linebackers versus running backs. When I was in Seattle, it, you know, Pete Carroll was, was so high on competition, he would always do matchups in, in our team meeting to start the day. And it was usually a running back versus a linebacker at some point. It was a corner versus a wide receiver at some point. Same thing with the O-line, D-line. And he would just highlight it. He would just pick two guys. Hey, this is the matchup I'm looking at uh, today at practice. So you better, you know, you better get your cleats ready. And that's the matchup I'm looking at, man. Ashton Gentry and Jackson Woodard, they're going to be going at it. You so, know, I think the thing – go ahead. Oh, I mean, hey, uh, when, you, when you have those matchups with the Seahawks, you ever get matched up against Bobby? All the time. <laughs> oh, man, that, that was <laughs> that was all the time, man. That was all the time. You know, we, we, we and you want it best on best or you want it to go up against the best. And that is what the, you know, the interesting thing, the significant thing about this matchup is you're, 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 you're truly getting best on best. I mean, you know, Jackson may not get the national attention, but he's one of the best linebackers in the nation. If you watch the tape. I'm right there with you. Watch the tape. I'm right there and with so, you. I mean, he's yeah. got, dude's got four interceptions on the year, second most in the country, 
eight and a half tackles for loss. He's on pace to go well over 100 tackles on the season. And it, Robert, I'm not. I'm going to ask you for another comp when it comes to Jackson Woodard here. For for me, and I, I don't. I did not think about this nearly to the length that you did. But I'm just trying to compliment Jackson because you're right. He does not get enough national attention. His his length, his athleticism, his versatility. Boise State had a linebacker here a few years ago. Name was Leighton Vanderish. Went in the first round. 141 tackles, eight and a half tackles for loss. Yep. Three picks his senior year. That elevated him to the 19th overall pick in the draft by the Dallas Cowboys. There might be a better comparison, but I'm just talking about pure playmaker on the field, not a bad comparison. And it's one that at least Boise State fans will understand and it'll get their attention, I believe. Yeah. You know, the, the reason why I'm going to comp Jackson with this player is because of his high IQ for the game. So if you talk to Jackson, it, his game is like he's a physical player, but it's really predicated upon pre-snap reads. Like he's really into the details. And another linebacker that was like that was Luke Keekley, who we used to always have to play against when he was with the Carolina Panthers. All right. He wasn't always the biggest guy or the strongest, but he had such a high IQ for the game, he was always there to make the tackle, and he was always there in coverage to be able to make the play as well. Luke Kiki get his hands on the ball also. So that's the comp that I would have for Jackson Warder if I had to comp him with anybody. But this is going to be a heck of a matchup. I would like to see Boise do this because we haven't seen it this year that much, and you mentioned it. Ashton has so much versatility utilize it a little bit more in this football game so he doesn't have the catches and things of that nature so far this season like he has the ability to but it's just not on the stat sheet let's see if Dirk Cutter and Boise State can open that aspect up to this game and get him involved in the passing game a little bit more challenge a guy like Jackson Water to guard Ashton GT one-on-one -on, -one on an option route coming out of the backfield consistently or have him out on screen passes and things of that nature. Open up his game and utilize his versatility a little bit. I, I, I'd like to see that from Boise. I like it. And, hey, at ha halfway through the season, everybody's got a lot of tape out there right now. It seemed like that might be a little curveball for this team that they, they might have in their back pocket or whatever to face this UNLV squad. Hey, I, I want to ask you this because one thing that Boise State does under Dirk Cutter, they do a great job of using pre-snap motions and things like that to reveal what a defense is doing. You say that Jackson Woodard is so is so intelligent, right? So how does that play against a player that that might not fool? You might be tipping your cards to him. Like, how do you think that battle kind of works out? Yeah, it's it's interesting because you can get a lot of tells from personnel. All right, now you know what the personnel is. What's the motion? And if you've done this in previous games. I think Jackson's going to eat that stuff up, man. He's going to be all over it. You know, he's the type of player that's going to call out plays before the snap. But this is where Dirk Cutter is, is, comes into play, his greatness, his mm -hmm. experience. He, he knows this. He's played against linebackers for years who have great pre-snap evaluation and can be able to read plays. And so he's going to have some things in his playbook that UNLV has never seen and they're going to be able to capitalize on that. Robert, I'll get you out of here shortly. What else stands out to you about this matchup? I think special teams for me is, is a huge uh, area of emphasis in this game. Uh, what I love about Barry Odom, man, he, he will use anybody and everybody that he needs to on special teams. I mean, we just talked about Jackson Woodard, Ricky White the third. These are all conference guys that play on a number yeah. of special teams. Ricky's been one of my favorite wide receivers in the Mountain West for a long time. Mm -hmm. It'll be interesting to see if Boise State, and I'm going to ask Coach Danielson about this when I get an opportunity, is there a corner on the Boise State defense that you just, that you just say, hey, you, you got this guy all day? Or is it a team thing? Yeah, everybody approaches it differently. You know, there are some teams that just like sometimes, sometimes Sherman, most of the time Sherman played on the left side, but hey, Sometimes he had to mirror wide receivers if it was a special guy. Ricky, to me, is a special guy. I'd like to see what that matchup looks like. In the NFL, Bobby Wagner played punt team for seven years of his career before the Seahawks finally 
said, okay, you don't have to start off punt anymore. You're on track to be a Hall of Fame linebacker, you know. But, you know, Barry Odom and this team, that approach, that's why they win. But Boise State is very similar in how they're just whatever, whatever it takes to be a team. You hear about Ash and Jinty trying to get on kickoff all the time. Right. And so that lets you know that this is why this is going to be such a great game because you're playing against two teams that are really selfless. All right. And so it makes for an, an interesting matchup. How the quarterback for UNLV, Haj, how Boise State defends him, I think is going to be one of the keys, one of the underrated keys to this matchup because of his ability to run with the football. And I don't know if Boise State has gone up against somebody quite like him just yet this season. Hey, Hodge has been phenomenal. I feel like he's almost unlocked the UNLV offense. I mean, his 183 QB efficiency rating, he doesn't qualify right now because he hasn't played in, in, in enough games. But that right now would be third best in college football if he, if he was a qualifier. I, I don't think... People are even giving that kid enough credit. So, I, I, know, I don't know if it's fair to ask you for a prediction here, Robert, because you're on the call. But just how, yeah. do you, how do you think this game kind of plays out between two Mountain West heavyweights, the conference mm -hmm. that, you know, you know, you once, uh, you're, you're, you're alma mater's in now, right? So, how do you think this game plays out? Well, it's going to come down in the fourth quarter, and I won't give a prediction because I'm not allowed to. And I but get that. It, it, it will come down in the fourth. Here's the thing. Boise State. They're used to this. They've been in tons of big games historically. They've been in big games this season. You mentioned University of Oregon and others. UNLV, they have to be, you know, they have to stay composed in this football game. They have to be able to battle through adversity, and they can't let the hype of this single game get to them. They got to treat it like it was Utah State last week. That, that is the mental approach that they have to have. And I'd like to say one more thing before we go. You got it. Because I know there's been a little bit of talk back and forth, Travis Hunter, Ashton Gentry. You got to love what Ashton Gentry said in response. I love it. Uh, yeah. The only thing that I would say to Travis is, you know, because he mentioned the 95 touches, just, just keep in mind that those are 95 touches that, are, that he's getting at the line of scrimmage or behind the line of scrimmage. So if, 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 if you're Travis Hunter and you think you can just catch screen passes 95 times and have the same production, then perhaps you have a point. But the difference is Ashton's got to get the ball at or behind the line of scrimmage, navigate through a lot of traffic, probably break an arm tackle or two or three to be able to get that type of production. That receiver, like it or not, and I'm not hating, I'm just saying, you run a 20 to 25 yard dig route, you sit there and cover two in the zone, you catch, you fall, that's 25 yards on your stat sheet. I'm just saying, it's different. It's just different. Hey, I, I'm right there with you. I mean, running behind, in between, I mean, what's, what's the line in total? Almost 1,500 pounds of humans, right? Like, that's a little bit different than catching the ball out in space. Robert, I can't thank you enough. This, is, this has been awesome. And for all of you out there, 8.30 p.m. Mountain Time, CBS Sports Network, Boise State, UNLV. You will hear this voice on the call. Robert, we appreciate you. Thanks for having me. Kind of a last-second request, but we got the job done. I head down to UNLV on Wednesday. Again, game day is Friday. We will be live on KTVB Friday evening, that hour leading up to kickoff. Our coverage starting at 7 o'clock again on Channel 7, and we will have plenty of coverage going up to kickoff. And one last quick note for you that just came in. Boise State has sold out their last three home games. Six for six. Director of Athletics Jeremiah Dickey said it was his goal to sell out every football game in a year, and he did it. Selling out the last game only about, what, five, six weeks before it actually takes place against Oregon State. All right, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. This is Jay Sports Bar serving the Idaho sports community.